When I started watercolor painting, what I wanted was pure, perfect skies, photographically perfect. I haven't wanted that for years, but I'm going to teach you how if you want to. Let me show you how to make a perfect sky, and let me do it on the back of this old piece of paper. So there's already some blue stains and a couple of yellow spots on here. You need a couple of things. You need to have your paper thoroughly soaked. It's got to be completely saturated, and I've already done that. But then, you got to worry about something funny. You got to worry about your margins. You got to worry about water pooled at the edge of the paper. So you got to wipe down the edge, and you have to wipe it in such a way that you're actually touching the paper with your wiper, in this case a paper towel. You're going to see me do that a few times. So now I know I've got a saturated piece of paper and dry around it. And what I'm going to do here is use a non-sedimentary color, a light floaty pigment particle. In this case, this is thalocyanine blue. It's a gorgeous paint. I would not want to be without it for a lot of reasons. One of them is just that beautiful blue. It's inexpensive. It's, um, it's staining. Maybe that's a bad thing, but sometimes you need a staining color. And it's definitely, definitely, definitely not sedimentary. It has no significant sedimentary properties. I'm going to paint, what I'm doing here, I'm smoothing it out. What I'm doing is looking for any lumps that might be in the paint, a dried out spot or something, and I just wanted to make sure that there were none. Now, where's the water? The water's in the paper. I don't need a whole lot of water. I just need a whole lot of paint. And I need it pretty darn dark up on top. Maybe not this dark, but remember two things. Number one, watercolor dries lighter than you see it. Number two, now see what I'm doing? I'm thinning this. Number two, I'm going to put clouds in here afterwards and without Without a dark color, there's no way to create a light cloud. The other thing I'm doing is I am diluting the paint as I go down the paper. And the reason for this is that's what real skies do. Real skies are much darker up at the zenith than they are at the horizon. They're just a deeper, deeper blue. This is a, a piece of brush I'm picking off here. Now, I'm going to go once quickly this way. I can get away with this because this stuff is floating. It's not yet stuck down in the paper. And then I'm going to go back a couple of times over this way. And now, once, slowly, tell you what, first thing I'm going to do is just quickly pick up some of the edge water. I'm not going to try to do a good job, but I'm going to try to get it out of there a little bit. I'm going to now slowly and deliberately drag my brush from off of the paper, across the paper, and off of the paper. 
overlapping strokes, drag it across, off. Drag it across, off. Across, off. Across, off. Across, off. Off now. Leave it alone. I guess that's the biggest trick there is. Don't worry about it. Leave it alone. Do, do what I'm doing. Babysit this thing as it's drying. Don't let water flow out of the paper and then flow back in from the side. That, you can get a mess over here. And I don't even understand the physics of it. But I know that you got to babysit your paper, particularly the sides. Just keep them dry. Now when I say babysit it, I don't mean constantly. Uh, every minute or two or three or four, depending a lot on the weather, how fast things are drying. I'm about now to say something stupid. Before we start to work with this guy, we have to catch the exact moment just before the shine disappears. And yeah, I know. How do you know the moment before something's going to happen? And that's the problem. But every experienced watercolor painter can do this. And of course, no inexperienced watercolor painter can do this. I think what I'm looking for is some variation in the shine, just like it starts to develop a texture. Then you can go. For some reason, this spot looks wrong. So you say, okay, well then, you had a white spot. I'm dampening this paper just a little bit here. Okay, you had a white spot. Now you have a cloud. Clouds rarely exist by themselves, so I'm going to make a cloud bank over here. Now you see how indistinct these clouds are? You thought I was putting it on real dark, didn't you? Actually, I put it on quite light. Here's another cloud over here, just a little one. And here's a couple of teeny ones off in the distance. There you go. Cloudy sky. You notice there's some old stain on here from when this paper was used for whatever. Let's say that you could develop a blemish and you don't know what to do with it. Well, don't worry about it. A blemish like that we can get rid of, and I'll show you how in a little while. I'm going to pick this up. Just put a small object under the back, just to tilt it ever so slightly upwards at the top, because I don't want paint flowing up. I'll take my one inch here, and I'll take a little bit of sedimentary green. This, this color's dangerous. Be careful with it, because it can... Um, it can overwhelm. There's nothing natural about this green. But then I'll mix it with this yellow to make a sunlight, sunlit vegetation uh, color. And I'll put a tree line over here. And we'll turn this into a real painting. Woohoo! You see how I splashed? I have to be so careful there. I guess I just got a bigger tree there. Okay. Now, when you're making tree lines, as with everything else, you're not making picket fences. Picket fences have even distribution, even height. Tree lines do not. Mountains do not. Man-made objects are uniform. 
Natural objects are anything but uniform. I can go very, very slowly here because I'm in no hurry. This paper is quite wet. I want things to diffuse, but I'm getting some really nice diffusion over there. See what's happening? Now I think I'm going to go for a deeper green. So we'll take a little bit of this and a little sedimentary blue. And a tiny touch of sedimentary red here. Oh, that gives me a very oh, lush green, Look at that color. That's, that's a natural color. So what I've done over here is I painted the tree tops, and now I'm going to paint in let's say the the tree bottoms. Still, I'm putting my primary effort into keeping things irregular, trying to keep the value a little irregular, and certainly trying to keep the line irregular. I'm going to dry this brush just a little bit, um, take some deep green, which I guess I'm going to make out of something other than green, because well, that's not deep at all. Because I need variety. There we go. There's a dark bluish green. Very thick. And so I'm going to make now, with my thick paint, the shadow area under the tree. And that too. We'll go up and down a bit, depending upon height of the trees, distance between the trees. You get the idea. Um, let's say the sun's on the right. So I'll put the shadows on the left side of anything tall. I'm not painting shadows. I'm not painting trees. I'm just suggesting that the trees are there. One of the things I love about painting is to learn how little information we actually have about the world. And this goes for life, war, but certainly it goes for vision. We don't see a lot. We think we see a lot. Our eye fills in an enormous amount of stuff that isn't there. Our brain does. We are very good at kidding ourselves into thinking that we humans are very smart, I wonder. Now, I'm not going to paint a lawn over here, but I'll paint a field of growing something. And I'll do that by starting with a fairly clean brush uh, and a lot of my sedimentary yellow. Here's yellow ochre. Well, I actually didn't mean to thin it this much. Let me pick up a little bit. and. Uh, now, we still have a saturated paper, more saturated so than you might think, because if there's any flow at all in the paper, the gravity is pushing it downward. Now, just because of the way things work, the way vision works and light works, stuff like oceans and fields of grass tend to be horizontal. You see them in horizontal strokes and you definitely see them stronger colors in the foreground. I guess I should have started stronger in the foreground here. 
And of course, much weaker as you get to the back. That would be, I don't want to put in a lot of water here and drive my paint line upwards because that's pretty good. I just want to be, have an indistinct edge between where the trees end and the vegetation begins. Oh, you know what we got? We got a marsh. You know, I was planning on painting something else. I've got a marsh. I'm going to just do nothing with it. Except that I have some problems in the sky. Uh, this original stain and what I believe to be a splash. I'm going to fix that, but I'm going to wait until it's entirely dry. There's just a little close-up while it's drying. Nice things are happening. I actually don't know what happened here. It may have happened right under my nose. Uh, I didn't see it happening. I just don't know what those two little light spots are there. I do see this original stain. Okay, I'm back. The painting is damp. How do I know it's damp? I touched it with the back of my fingers and it felt cool. Wet paper is cool. Dry paper is warm to the touch. Why the back of my fingers? Because the pads of your fingers are a whole lot more oily than the back of your fingers. Nevertheless, the edges have begun to pick up, so it's dry enough to handle. I'm going to go ahead. I've got three tools here. I've got a nice pointy brush, a brush that can form a really good point. I've got a piece of hand towel all crumpled up. And I've got my trusty tube of white gouache. Now, you might have a teacher who says, never use white. And I'm going to tell you, get a new teacher. There's no good reason why you don't want to use white. I don't have it on my palette because I don't want to contaminate any of my paintings with white. White does not lighten anything. White obscures paint. So if you mix it in with a paint, you're just going to get a chalky looking thing. Uh, Pastelli may be looking thing, but you're definitely not going to get a light, beautiful, transparent looking watercolor kind of thing. White is going to have to be very careful with. I use it away from my colors. I don't let them mix with my colors. I clean up when I'm done, but white has some marvelous uses. It's going to come up again and again in lessons. Now, suppose I say, well, this cloud doesn't look any good because the tops of clouds are lighter than that. Okay, so I'm squeezing out a little bit of my white. This is gouache. Watercolor would work. Gouache would work. It doesn't matter. They're kind of both the same thing anyway. I'm using a wet hand towel. Not wet, a damp hand towel. And um, pushing some damp paint, white paint, into where I want a little more lightness, a little more whiteness. And I'm making some nice fluffy clouds. A little more over here. Get some detail into that cloud, maybe a little bifurcation if I can. And. Um, Yeah, okay. Hey, there you go. That's good. This one's a little too heavy. Pick some of that up. Thing up on top doesn't look right to me. Yeah, it looked good before, but now it's just too, too dark. I need some lightness in it. And um, that's not bad. I kind of like that. This thing's just a little too, too light for my taste. So I want to smudge that a bit, and push it further back, maybe pick up a little of that white. There, that's what I want. Beautiful. We have this spot over here. Well, I could do the same thing. That would work just fine. But we have another option. I'm going to mix up a really dark color. 
something as close to a black as I can. So I will use my sedimentary red. This is a good way to get a black. There's a bunch of ways to get a black. And my sedimentary, my, my non-sedimentary, but really a little sedimentary blue. I like this color, but it does have some unusual properties that you have to know how to work with. That's uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. So now I've got brush. I want, to, I want the color a little bit wet because I don't want a, a strong stroke. If it's a very dark color, the eye will see it as very, very close. And that's something I don't want. I want a medium distance away. This looks good. You'll see what I'm doing here. It's kind of easy. Bart? No problem. There it is. That's an M bird. You can make V birds as well. Maybe you want, there's a little teeny spot. I don't know how it got there, but we'll make a V-bird. It's a V-bird. So your sky can be filled with birds. Your sky can be filled with clouds. Your sky can be filled with, God, balloons, airplanes. There's all sorts of excuses to fix a blemish in the sky. And now if I need some distant birds, well, I just thin this down a really lot. And then I can get rid of even these little guys here. They're barely visible. When you price your paintings, just charge twice as much for M birds as V birds. I'm kidding. Maybe not. Maybe I'm serious. Here we are. Sky full of birds, sky full of clouds. Lovely little painting. No big deal. But nice. I could live with this hanging on my wall anytime. Let me show you how it looks framed. I keep an old 11 by 14 mat around just for this purpose. What do you think? 